we've talked a terrific amount today, or you've listened a terrific amount today about the, the changes that perhaps need to be made by us all. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is going to talk about how we can create a coherent strategy out of all this talking, ensuring that everyone pulls together. So, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome, a round of applause for Herb Kim. Fantastic. Thanks for that introduction, uh, and thank you everyone for staying. It's, uh, it's great to see so many of you sticking around for the uh, final sessions of the day. So I'm going to begin, oh good, I've got my, my slides up here, uh, with uh, just a, a bit of background about me, because I realize that it's, uh, there's a probably a fair few of you that have not uh, had any uh, background or introduction to, to my work and to my story. So my story begins in Brooklyn. Uh, that's where I was born, uh, back in good old 1967. So I am getting on quite old, I'm afraid. Uh, and then I came to uh, England in 1997 to go uh, set up uh, the online bookstore for Blackwell's, uh, the bookshop chain and publishers that I'm sure that most of the people in the room have familiar with. And there I am, uh, a little thinner and certainly much younger, but back in uh, 1997. Uh, my last job before I moved to the north uh, was working at O2, uh, the mobile phone operator. I'm sure at least a few of you are, are subscribers. And um, I was actually about to take a job working for Orange when my best friend at O2, who was a Geordie, convinced me to look at a job in Newcastle. And I said, don't be ridiculous. I'm, I have no, I've never been to Newcastle. Well, I've been through Newcastle, but never actually stopped there and things like that. But it turned out that the recruiter for this particular role happened to be in London the next day and he was going to be uh, literally about 100 yards from where I lived. So I said, OK, I will go and see it. And, and one thing led to another. And in October 2002, I found myself driving past the Angel North and relocating to the northeast of England. And I, I went there uh, to set up a company called Codeworks. And we, at, a, at, a, at a high level, we were set up to, uh, uh, to promote and support the growth of the digital IT creative industries of the, nor of the northeast of England. And the early years were actually pretty good. We, uh, we, we got involved in a, success, a number of successful university research funding bids. We spun out three companies, or helped spin out three companies. We grew a, a, a local networking association to about 130 members. And life seemed generally pretty good. But in about 2004, something changed in the environment. And what was previously a very receptive and supportive funding agency called One Northeast, which is an RDA, a regional development agency. I think the Welsh version must have assumed was the WDA, the Welsh Develop or Wales De Development Agency. Uh, and from the chairperson all the way down to the directors, literally every single person that ran the place was, was changed for one reason. I won't get into the reasons as to why, but suddenly this is entirely new management. And if there's one thing that new management likes to do, it likes to do everything differently than the last management did stuff, right? And so what, uh, you know, digital and IT was once one of the things from the five really important sectors that the Northeast was going to focus on. And the new management was less convinced that that should be the case. And in February 2005, one of the directors of the RDA, One Northeast, came to a board meeting unannounced and told us that uh, our company, Codeworks, was going to be shut down, effective immediately, uh, and that, um, this was basically it. Uh, so learn, <laughs> deal with it and you know, deal, deal, deal with your new reality. So um, luckily, if my chairman and I decided that we were going to fight back. We weren't going to. And, and we survived this sort of full frontal assort, assault uh, that time. But the thing about a big political, well-funded organization like, a, like an RDA or a One Earth East was, that I don't want to pick on them in particular, is that they don't take defeat like that very easily. So they fought back. And they got smart. And instead of trying to come in and shut us down and make a big high-profile kill, they said, we're going we're gonna to gonna suffocate these guys over a bit of time. And so uh, I like to joke that the uh, austerity came to Codeworks a few years earlier than the rest of the UK. And uh, you can see the figures up there. But basically, our funding was cut by a million pounds, uh, pretty much effective immediately. Uh, and the year after that, our funding would go for, uh, from that to nothing. Uh, and that any future funding agreements would be based on our ability to generate a, really a fantastic amount of new cash. And, uh, you know, reading between the lines, it was, it was pretty obvious that this was just a very sm a much smarter way of, of, of trying to kill off um, our, 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 our company. 
So, um, I think uh, we had an earlier speaker today uh, mention this book. So I began, uh, of course, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to just die. I mean, the easy solution would have been to just leave, to go back to, go back to London, or maybe go back to America, sort of tail between my legs and say, yep, this whole is, this public sector stuff was just too hard. Uh, well, I'll, I'll stay in the nice private sector which, from, from whence I came. Um, but I didn't want to do that. So I started looking for ideas. And, and this book provided, uh, was, was one, I've read a lot of guru books and business books, and this is one of the few to really stand the test of time for me. Uh, and I won't summarize the entire book, but basically the book talks about focusing, right? So most people, when they get in trouble, they start flailing about and just desperately trying anything that will work, yeah? And the, the, the book's author uh, argues that that's exactly the wrong thing to do, right? And basically what you need to do focus is figure out what it is that you're passionate about, right? What, what is it that you really, really want to be spending your time with doing, yeah? The second thing is to figure out what it is that you're actually really good at. You know, not 10 things, you know, you imagine the, an imaginary job interview where they keep asking, are you good at this, are you good at this? And the temptation is to say, yep, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that. Do you really be honest with yourself and figure out well, what, is the, what are the one or two things that maybe you can really say, yeah, I'm better than you know, pretty much everyone I know. So the first question was pretty easy for us. You know, I, I was certainly was, my company was very passionate about digital, right? Digital, so digital media, digital technology, the internet, web, so on and so forth. So that was pretty easy. The second thing was something that we learned about ourselves in the process of running CodeWorks, which is that we were really good at running events. And that was not something that, you know, we, the, when I came in to run CodeWorks, I was going to be doing a lot of sort of investing, venture capital type activity, you know, hard technology development. And kind of by accident, we started developing all this networking stuff, really almost as a kind of good sort of uh, good neighbor type thing. And, uh, and, and, and I knew that this was good because we, we held an event with Microsoft in 2005, 2005 I think it was. Uh, and um, they wrote back after this, it was a one-day conference, and they wrote back after this conference and they said it was literally the most professionally run event they'd ever been a part of. And I thought, wow, Microsoft is telling us that, that we're that good at that, that we must be onto something, even if it was actually an accident. But the third thing you've got to figure out, once you figure out what you're good at and what you're passionate about, is how do you make a business out of it, right? So the first, you know, the, so fumbling around some more, and um, I happened to pick up an issue of The Guardian, uh, a copy of The Guardian, uh, which was unusual at the time because I never read The Guardian back then, but it just happened to be one lying around, and I read about something called the TED Conference, which I'm, I'm sure many people in the room have at least heard of, if not seen one or two of their talks, maybe attended a TEDx event. And um, I remember being really shocked by this thing for, for I remember reading the article, and the, the woman waxed lyrical about how amazing it was, and all the amazing people that she met, and so on and so forth. So I did what you do, of course, and I Googled it. And I was shocked to discover a couple things. One, it was an extraordinarily expensive conference. It was about $4,000 to attend. The second thing was that you had to apply to attend. And so, um, I, you know, naturally I couldn't afford that, but I found out that they gave out a handful of passes every year to a, for not-for-profit and charitable organizations. So I applied to get in the, via this route, and got, amazingly, they let me in. So I went to California, and I had an amazing experience. But one of the things I discovered was that this uh, three, half, four-day event made over $10 million in profit. Right? It was shocking how much money these guys could make in such a small period of time. So I thought, well, if I could just make like a thousandth of what these guys make, well, you know, our problems are solved, right? So my first idea is, so, well, I suggested I wrote it and I said, well, why don't we do Geordie Ted? And the Ted people didn't, they didn't, they weren't that warm to this idea. So we, uh, we continued on and we eventually came up with something slightly more prosaic, Thinking Digital, which is the, which is the name of the conference that I, that I continue to run today. And um, I must say that uh, local reaction to this, uh, to this idea, to this, this amazing idea that I had come back to the Northeast with, was basically not very warm, I should say, right? Uh, and you can read the, the these, are, these are all quotations, literally, from uh, a meeting that we had with, uh, with, an with our advisory board at the time. But we did it anyway, yeah. And uh, I remember we had a kind of cocky slogan at the time, we're going to go big or go home, yeah? And we bet the company on, the, on this idea. And like Ted does, we went and scoured the world to try and find, you know, a collection of the best, the most interesting, the most accomplished, the most creative, the most innovative people we could recruit to Newcastle. And we situated in what was then a very new Sage Gateshead Music and Conference Center uh, along the, on the Gateshead side of, of, of the time. And then I literally picked up my old marketing business school text and I just literally went down the list and said, everything that we need to do, we're going to just go and get the best of that we can find, yeah? 
So new brand, uh, we got some great sponsors, a new website, a blog, and so, so, on and so, so on and so forth. And we really did bet the company on this thing. And I would love to say that after making this huge gamble that it was just an immediate success and people loved us and you know, our problems were solved. But the reality was is that um, really we were heading much closer to something that I might describe as an, as an epic fail uh, at the time. And, and, to go in and, 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 and quickly all this talk about good to great in the TED conference became much more about survival and saving face. And to just give you some sense of that, so we held the event in its first year in a venue that held about 375 people. And I remember with about six weeks ago, we only had about 150 tickets sold. So we were looking at a very empty and embarrassing uh, 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 event uh, to, to close my career in the northeast of England. And I like to joke that the, 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 this period of my life was an up at dawn, pride swallowing siege as I desperately tried to find ways to get people to attend and, and support the, the, the event. Well, we get there in the end, uh, and it was ugly, uh, but we do get there in the end, and I would call the attendance face-saving. It was certainly not anywhere near full. Um, the financial loss is basically double what we forecast, and, it, and, and really, not just that, but it's kind of, we had no, we, the organization, despite thinking we were great events, we had no idea how much more complicated doing a two and a half day conference would be, but we survived. And in 2009, we rolled the dice once again, uh, partially because we kind of have no choice at this point. If we can't make this thing work, there is no company. Two weeks after we launched the 2009 conference, which would have been in September 2008, Lehman Brothers collapses, and the beginning of the financial crisis hits, the, you know, grips the world. Uh, in, in terms of how it impacted us, um, our our two biggest sponsors from the year before, Microsoft and Cisco, both announced immediately they're pulling out of the conference. They won't be able to support it. They won't be able to send any speakers. They're not going to be able to send any delegates, so please leave us alone. So uh, I you know, remember thinking when we were about to launch the 2009 conference, well, it couldn't get any worse than 2008, right? And uh, I suddenly realized, wow, it could actually be worse this time. But a strange thing happened, uh, and, and what we did in reaction was we had uh, set aside all this money to do huge amounts of marketing, and we, we then said we're going to just put all that stuff into, into early 2009 because there's, there's no point in trying to, do, to trying to compete against all the bad news around the financial crisis. But a weird thing started happening in October of that year is that people started to register and in big numbers. And and we couldn't actually figure out why, because we weren't doing any active marketing, right? We were busy actually look, trying to find other sources of money to try and pl plug in the gaps when this, con this next conference didn't do as well as, as we had forecast. And things started, continued to go well through, to, through November, December, and finally in January, we came back and they said, we decided, well, things have gone so well, we don't actually need to spend all that money we were planning to spend. Uh, so we canceled most of our marketing. In the end, half of the budget we had set aside goes unspent. And we ended up selling two months early. Our, our attendance is way up, our ticket revenue is way up, you know, basically it's all basically good news. So the natural question is what happened, right? So how do we go from that to that? So I mentioned there are all sorts of negatives in 2008. Uh, one of the positive things is that for the, the relative handful of people who came in 2008, they actually really liked the experience. They really loved the speakers. And, and part, of the, part of the way we knew that is that we were such amateurs at the time is that we actually put out a 14-page online survey and, and, and we, we, afterwards, we, we, we went back and we realized that it would take no less than 40 minutes to fill this thing out if you actually answered every question in detail, which is exactly not what you should be doing about online surveys. Anyways, so one of the things that, that made a big difference was, 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 was social media. And, and today, this is not news, but at the time, you know, we had no social media plan whatsoever. And in blogs, online video, and Twitter, uh, things really uh, made a big difference for us. So one of the people, one of the persons who attended the 2008 conference happened to be one of the better known UK tech bloggers, a guy named Steve Clayton. He's currently now the chief storyteller at Microsoft based over in Seattle. You won't be able to read, well, you might be able to read a little bit there. And basically he says really nice things in his blog, uh, you know, about uh, how much he enjoyed the experience last year. Uh, that in 2008. Uh, another thing that happened was that Sky actually covered the 2008 conference, right? And that's, which is nice, a bit of a surprise. But one of the big things was that, of course, in, in, even five years earlier, had they covered the conference, they might have aired a, uh, you know, a, a segment on, on, the, on the cable channel, and might have run a few times, and that would be it, right? And it would, kind of be, it would just be history. Of course, in 2008, they're now putting everything online, right? And so this suddenly becomes something, another piece of thing that people can share. 
But the big story for us was Twitter. And what happened in Twitter, with Twitter is that, not surprisingly, in 2008 and 2009, Google was, um, uh, was our, our number one referring website. But what happened in Twitter was that it goes from 3.1% of all referrals to 21%, right? So it goes up by a factor of 700%, right? And, and this is just a dramatic increase, which was this unexplained surge in people buying and registering tickets and, and doing all sorts of good things. So the story continues on through 2010, 2011. Uh, we, we then we get named into the top 100 influ and most influential uh, organizations and people with, uh, with the Wired 100 and, and the, and the Guardian, uh, Media Guardian list. Uh, the Next Web uh, writes a, a wonderful uh, write-up of the 2012 conference, calling us the UK's answer to TED. Uh, this is in the Metro newspaper in London. Uh, and then, you know, so for the, the, uh, this whole period of my life inspired by TED sort of began with, with The Guardian. And, and it was particularly satisfying for them to then describe us as the UK's TED in 2012. Another big thing happened in 2012, which is I sold my house in Liverpool. Here's a picture of our formerly lovely uh, kitchen diner and bought the conference for my company and, and I'm now sort of living, if you will, the whole entrepreneurial adventure uh, very personally. So coherent regional strategy, which was the sort of the task that I've been given, and I was, I, hopefully all that stuff, stuff is, is provides some, some, some sense of the adventure that, that I've been in through to try and uh, achieve one. Uh, and just some, just some, some, quick, some, quick, uh, a quick, some quick highlights is that, you know, 2002, you know, really we saw very limited amounts of, I mean, there was Sage, which was a big, big company. Now, it was shocking to me that we, given we had Sage, which is the only foot software company in the FTSE 100, that we, the entire region strategy wasn't basically around IT and digital, but it wasn't at all. Uh, it was seen to be an outlier, a kind of freakish accident that we happened to have this massively successful company in the Northeast. Uh, we had very little startup activity, and we were very patchy in terms of the medium-sized organizations. By a dozen years later, that's totally changed. Sage is much bigger. Uh, now we've got Accenture, HP, Virgin, HMRC. We've got a much bigger medium-sized sector, and we've got a really strong startup community, which is perhaps one of the most exciting things that, that, that we've got. This is a map that the Observer did recently of, of what they felt were the UK tech hotspots, hotspots. And it was, a, you know, it, was a, it, was, it was a massively proud moment for me to see that Newcastle, of, of all places, believe me, 12 years ago, Newcastle would not have been anywhere near this map at all. So it was great to see it on that map. A little bit about TDC, which I'm going to go through all this sort of stuff here, is that to me, I think the effect that TDC has, I mean, I don't want to overestimate it, but to me, I see it as a kind of digital angel of the north. You know, it was, a, it was an iconic thing to happen in Newcastle. It was almost shocking that it could work. And then hence, very exciting, and it kind of, I don't know. Like, it, it was very motivating for people, I think. Uh, in terms of coming up with a strategy, you know, to do a regional strategy thing, typically you're going to have to hire some consultants who are going to create a very big, lengthy report. And that's fine. I don't want to be too negative about this sort of stuff. I find oftentimes that the people uh, in charge of economic development tend to be overly dependent on this sort of stuff. It is occasionally useful. Money, of course, naturally helps. I would, I would say, though, that it is simply a tool. Money is, 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 is not obviously a panacea. It does not heal all. Um, a little bit actually well-placed helps a lot more than a, than a fire hose. I would think of it as a watering can for your garden as opposed to a fire hose. And in the end, you know, it's, it's funny, looking back, it's, it's, it's easy to kind of say, oh, there must have been a brilliant regional strategy that drove all this success. But the reality is I think it was really just more a deeply held belief among a relatively small group of people that IT and digital could and should be part of, of a regional economic strategy for the Northeast. And so I say ultimately it is all about the right people. You know, it is actually not that much about money. It is actually not that much about technology. It is actually about finding the right people. A little quote here, never doubt that a small group of community people can, can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever does, which is a quote from Margaret Mead, which uh, I often uh, hark back to. My last point here is that if you're trying to do this in Wales or any other region, it's ultimately about trying to build confidence. And that's what we didn't have when I showed up in 2002. There wasn't really a much confidence that digital or IT could be part of a Northeast future, uh, which was part of the big battle that we fought. I've got, if I've got time for it, I've got a 40-second clip that I like to play. Do I have time for it? Are you going to play it for me? OK, cool. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is, and your 
your life is just to live your life inside the world. Try not to bash into the walls too much. Uh, uh, try to have a nice family life. Uh, have fun. Save a little money. That's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can you can build your own things that other people can use. Um, once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.